today's wait a minute i need to move this hold on one second okay so um this is our wheel office hours calls and for those of you who um, are new to the call my name is michelle mcnerney i am the division administrator of workforce services at iowa workforce development so my team is responsible for the oversight and compliance of the federal and state workforce programs that run through Iowa Workforce Development. So that includes the WIOA Title I funds that are um, given down to the local workforce areas. And that's what we're really here to talk about today, all things we owe us. So these calls are really designed to be a place for us to um, provide guidance and updates to um, the local stakeholders of the system which includes chief elected officials, uh, the local board members, and the staff to the local boards. And then also just a space for you all to be able to ask any questions that you may have um, and really connect with your peers and, and do peer learning as well. So today's objectives are really related to um, three things. So we have the local grant recipient identification and implementation that is, is being worked on right now. Um, the recent guidance that I sent out on Tuesday related to the ability of the chief elected officials to refuse WIOA funds, um, which is in response to a question that was posed by one of the local areas, and then local area realignment. So those are the topics that we're going to talk about today. Um, this is just a quick overview of our agenda. We're going to start um, today. We are being joined by um, our federal project officer from the Department of Labor Region 5 office in Chicago. And so she's going to really just kind of kick us off with some remarks and we'll be here to help answer any questions as well. Um, we'll review again briefly the local grant recipient and the subrecipient agreement example that I sent out earlier this week and um, ask for any feedback that you might have. We'll talk through the, the guidance that I sent out related to the refusal of funds and then just allow for any questions related to local area realignment if there are any. So let me just start by introducing Stacey O'Keefe. So again, she's our federal project officer from the DOL ETA Region 5 office in Chicago, which basically means she's assigned to Iowa. Um, she has been with us since I started in this role way back in 2017. Well, I guess I wasn't in this role at that time, but when we first started um, talking about compliance of WIOA in Iowa, Stacy has been involved since then, and so she's very knowledgeable about where we've been, where we're heading, and, and all of those things. So Stacy, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you um, sort of kick us off. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, hopefully, I can um, assist uh, with the state in answering any questions um, and addressing any concerns that you all have. Um, just briefly in terms of context, like Michelle said, I've been involved since the very beginning, the very first uh, monitoring report where we identified some really fairly major structural uh, issues that uh, rendered the state and local systems out of compliance with the law and the regulations. And, um, you know, we have been working with the state as well as with the contractor um, to address these major structural issues um, in the best manner feasible. And it's um, it's hard. It's taken a, a lot of work, a lot of education, a lot of training. You all have been, um, you know, right in the thick of it. And um, it's not easy. And, you know, certain things needed to happen before other things could happen. And so now, we're at another point in the transformation where some further work needs to be done in terms of um, identifying uh, a, an administrative entity, I'll say, or what Michelle called a subrecipient. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is 
Um, I understand that, you know, there's frustration um, because there still is more work to be done. And the main challenge that we saw in 2017, or maybe even I would say uh, at the root of a lot of the structural issues uh, is the fact that there, you know, the funding for the for a rural state like Iowa is still spread too thin. And so that makes uh, identifying uh, a subrecipient um, much more difficult in, in many of our states, most of them. There's sufficient funding to staff the local board in a way that that entity could incorporate and serve as the subrecipient. Um, in Iowa, there there just isn't. We just don't have the the funds for that. So that that issue, that sort of root uh, foundational issue in Iowa, still remains. And so we're looking at how can we help you, you know, move forward on this sort of next uh, version 2.0 uh, within the you know the limitations of you know, the number of local areas that currently exist and the funding that those local areas have. So thanks, Michelle. Um, that's really all I have, unless anybody has any questions. You know, I know we're going to move through a lot of details. So does anybody have any questions for Stacy right now? Or we can always just ask as we move along. You can always put questions in the chat or just unmute yourself. Okay, well, let's go through. Um, the PowerPoint today is pretty brief because most of this information is an overview of things that have been covered um, a few times already. And really what we wanna do is just give any um, an opportunity to everybody now that you've received um, some of the additional guidance from us to ask any questions um, that we can we can try to answer today. So again, um, what we what we've started with is making sure that for July 1st, 2023, when we are going to release the um, program year 23 funding for Title I, that we have a true um, subrecipient relationship in place uh, for those funds to flow down to the local area. And so just as a couple reminders, um, in WIOA, the, the law and the language refers to a local grant recipient. This, this It's never really defined, but um, we do know by the law that by default, the, the CLEO, so the chief lead elected officials, unit of government is the um, local grant recipient unless they have designated an alternative entity to serve in that local grant recipient role. Um, as a reminder, this is the definition of a subrecipient. And so again, it's an entity, typically a non-federal entity that receives that subaward um, from the pass-through entity, which is IWD, um, to carry out the, a part of the federal award. And you're carrying out that part for your local workforce area. Um, this is not an individual, it is an entity, and they may be receiving federal funds directly from a federal awarding agency in, in certain instances. But in, for these funds specifically, um, it's a subrecipient through the pass-through IWD. So again, um, the local grant recipient is that subrecipient of IWD. And then further down the line, once the local area has the money, they will then um, be a pass-through entity and have subrecipients themselves, which are the one-stop operators and the service providers that you um, procure to provide the services in the local area. And as a reminder, the law lays out really three options for the local area to determine who that local grant recipient is and who will enter into that sub-award with IWD. So option A is just the CLIO's unit of government acts as the local grant recipient. Option B, the, the CLIO designates an alternate entity to serve as that local grant recipient. Or option C, the CLIO's unit of government is the local grant recipient, but then they designate an entity to be the fiscal agent. Um, if that's the case, then that is not 
a subrecipient relationship between the local grant recipient and fiscal agent, that's a contract for the fiscal agent to provide very specific duties related to the handling of the funding. Um, and so all of this information has been reviewed and sent out to you in, in detailed and in, in more detail um, in the local, local grant recipient guide that was developed and used for training and reviewed um, in December at the first office hours call post training. So just as a reminder, I think this sentence really sums up the relationships that we're establishing here, which is IWD becomes the grant recipient from the federal government, right? And that's on behalf of the governor. We then serve as the pass-through entity and provide a sub-award to the local grant recipient, which creates a sub-recipient relationship. So the local grant recipient terminology and sub-recipient terminology are sort of used interchangeably, um, but I try very hard to be intentional about that so that we don't get confused because it's obviously very confusing um, with all this different language. So uh, on Tuesday, I sent an email that had an example of the subrecipient agreement that we're going to be using. It is still in draft form. Um, so we're still working through with our legal team to make sure that we have terminology correct, consistent, all of those things, um, because this is new for IWD as well. This is a change for us as well. I think I've been pretty clear about the fact that this is not just the locals changing, but the state changing as well. And so um, for I, I, I'm pretty confident in saying that that the content is is what it will be. Right. But um, we may. So, you know, for example, there's a force majeure section of this contract like that section will be there. We may still change the wording a little bit, but um, the concept and the content is is, is the same. So. What I wanted to do now is give you an opportunity um, to ask any questions about that, that agreement or this process of identifying who the local grant recipient is in your local area. Okay, well, I don't see any hands up or questions in the chat. Um, I'll go over the timelines at the bottom just when we kind of wrap up and review next steps. So let's go on to the next section. I guess I skipped my question slide. So the next section um, is new information. So this is related to the refusal of WIOA funds by CEOs. So for those of you that were on the, the last office hours call in December prior to the holidays, um, there was a local area that had asked the question, you know, what happens if as chief elected officials, we refuse the funding and we dissolve our 2080 agreement, which is what we call it in Iowa, but by federal law is the um, shared liability agreement between the local areas CEOs on how the, the liability of funds will be shared, right? So um, this is a very new question uh, and situation that has been asked across the country. Um, so it's taken us quite a while in working with Stacy at the local or at the regional office level and at the national office level with DOL um, ETA folks to really determine an answer to this question. So I apologize. It's not that we haven't been working on it. It's just that there's really not a lot of precedence for this. And so it took a while to figure out the answer. Um, so the guidance from the USDOL, which is what I detailed out in the, in the email, um, I sent that to directly to all the CLIOs, local board chairs and staff, and asked them to forward that on to everyone else. Um, but basically the answer is yes, um, chief elected officials can refuse the funding, um, and by doing so, choose to no longer operate as a local workforce area. So um, as, as a, just a sort of a side note, all the CEOs in the area need to agree to that, right? So to, to disband the local area, all CEOs are agreeing that they don't want the funding anymore. Um, so I'll use Western Iowa as an example. That's where the question started. So Western Iowa exists uh, of 18 counties. And so if all 18 CEOs agree to refuse the funds, then what they're gonna do is they're gonna, they're gonna um, draft a letter that's signed by all of those CEOs individually and the local board chair. Um, it'll be addressed to Director Townsend at IWD and, and basically state their intent to refuse the funds and no longer operate as a local workforce area. 
So by refusing the funds, it does remove fiscal liability from the chief elected official. So if funds are ever misspent or, or disallowed costs happen, then the, the chief elected officials in their counties um, are not responsible to pay back those funds, right? Um, in talking with Department of Labor, we, we agree that this would become effective July 1st. That's really to be able to ensure that there is um, time for the state to figure out what the next step is for services in that local area because this does make the state become responsible for um, ensuring continuity of service for the constituents of the local area that, or the previous local area that refused the funds, right? And so the only, um, I said, I guess, so if the CEOs refuse the funds, the, um, I'm trying to think of the right term here, Stacey, um, I guess the consequence of that is that the CEOs and, and by definition, then the local board, the local board would be disbanded and decertified and there would no longer be local input into the workforce system in the local area. So um, all that falls to the state to ensure continuity of service. And there are several ways that we can do that. Again, I detailed that out in the email. Um, we can try to work with another local area to absorb those counties um, and create a new local area. Um, to do that, the, the county's CEOs of the, of the other local area absorbing the old counties, old local area counties would take on fiscal liability for those other counties. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go out on a limb and guess there aren't many CEOs that are gonna be willing to do that, <laughs> but uh, that's that's a step in a process that as a state, we would try to work to, to, to do because at the end of the day, what we wanna do and what DOL is concerned with is ensuring constituents still have access to services, right? And, and that's what that we wanna do too. So if that, if that does not work, then um, the state would take on responsibility for providing services, so. Um, that's kind of a summary of what that looks like. Again, I detailed it out, I think, more clearly in the email, but what questions do you have related to that guidance? Okay, you guys are very quiet this morning. Um, okay, well, there Michelle, no sorry, yeah. I, I, uh, I have this plain, I wouldn't be multitasking ever. Um, <laughs> but my, my kind of wondering is, and I know our, our area isn't necessarily um, part of this, but I feel like, you know, when one area is impacted all really are right to some capacity. So yeah. I guess, you know, my curiosity would be in that instance, you know, then how that might look and play out would be essentially that the state is taking over the um, operations of the local area, and then it would be the state directing everything going on in whatever area decides to do this. And, you know, would the state like have a also convene a board? So would there be like an executive director of that local board? Um, if there is one, right? And then really, if there is a service delivery challenge or issue or whatever, the CEOs then and locals, of course, the state is our partner, right? And here to serve us. But like, yeah. in theory, like there's really not much that could be done or, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is there's really not any um, local leadership because it's state run. And so then there's there's not as much maybe influence Correct. on what what needs to yeah. be advocated for from a local perspective. Yes, correct. And I would say, Krista, that um, the the what ifs are really hard for us to answer right now, because, again, and there are not any um, really examples of this happening anywhere in the country to, to fall back on to say, well, here's clearly what happened, you know, in Idaho or wherever, so this is what we'll do. So we're gonna be sort of um, 
you know, creating this solution as we go. So again, as I have always said, communication is key in us um, and, and communication as soon as possible with local areas that are contemplating this because we want to be able to ensure that continuity of service. So right now, all the local boards um, have existing contracts with service providers. I believe most of them run probably through June 30th. And, um, you know, so we we would need to work with the local area to look at those contracts. Are those going to have to be reassigned to the state? Are they going to just dissolve on June 30th and the state will come up with a way to provide service? I mean, there are a lot of questions to be answered in that regard. Another thing that I can say is that, um, you know, yes, I think that potentially we would see a new board, but it would not be a board that was sat by the CEOs, right? Because they've given up their fiscal responsibility and therefore their right to have sort of influence and, and input on the system. Um, and so I think we would, we, you know, this is just in my mind thinking about, you know, what, what that possible solution looks like, because I, I do believe in the importance of local control of the system. I think we've talked about that for, for several years now, right? And, you know, Somebody in um, Cherokee County knows better what's going on in Cherokee County than I do in Des Moines, right? Um, and that's kind of the point of local control. Um, so, but if that goes away and the state's put in place, one thing I could tell you as how it impact, impacts the other local areas, as you mentioned, is um, we will still run the total state allocation through the allocation formula, right? With those old sort of counties that previously were, let's say, Western Iowa, um, getting an allotment, just like they would have if there was a local board in place through the CEOs, and then the state would take that money and um, utilize it to provide services. And keep in mind that when we're talking about this, and this is hard, um, this is hard because, sorry, Chrissy, your other comment, I read that and it threw me off my thought. This is sorry. <laughs> um, shoot, what was I talking about? Um, you're basically saying it can be hard because, you know, locally, if if we're not giving that, you know what I mean? You're not hearing from what we need. Oh, well. I know. Yeah, thank you. So the, what's hard about this whole process that we've talked about before is this new notion of the local board having sort of oversight and setting a strategic vision for the whole system. But what we're specifically talking about right now is the Title I funding and who is it has control over that funding and is making decisions related to that funding, right? There are still partners at the table. There's still Title II, there's still Title IV, there's still Title III, right? None of that work goes away. That coordination of programs and all of those things is still going to be happening. It's just going to be happening at the direction of, well, or with IWD at the table in really two seats, right? Because we have the, the Title III funds and now we would also have control of the Title I funds. But locally, that work with partners and making sure we have centers available for people to receive services and, and all that is still gonna continue. Um, but again, with the state in, in, in charge. Now, we have staff in those centers, right? We have staff in the local area. They're gonna be heavily involved. Um, but I cannot tell you today exactly what that looks like. So, um, and thanks for the comment. Yeah, we can look at that. Sandy, I see your hand is raised. My question is, okay, if um, we do decide to cancel, you know, the agreement between the CEOs, I'm the Clio for it. Yep. Does IWD have the workforce to be able to ensure that services will continue the way they had been doing? I mean, will you still work with children and family services to, you know, initiate these programs and, and such? How's that going to work? I don't know. I don't know, Sandy. I think that all of the options are on the table. I mean, could we, so let's say um, North Central Iowa, right? So right now you're budgets around $500,000, I think, something like that. So let's say North Central Iowa disbands and IWD has to take over because we can't find another local area that's willing to sort of absorb those counties and also take on the fiscal liability for those counties. So IWD takes over. I think there are several options. I think we could still procure service providers with that $500,000, right? We could um, use that $500,000 to hire staff that are state staff to pay to, to work in the centers and provide Title I services. Um, I think there are many options on the table and those are the specific questions 
I can't answer because I don't know. And, um, you know, I see Stacy sort of shaking her head. I mean, we've been having conversations about this for weeks now and trying to figure out exactly what it will look like. And the reality is, is um, it's going to be a process. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to do the best we can to ensure that services are um, provided as robustly as, you know, they can be. Yeah. And I would just add, uh, you know, to what Michelle is saying, you know, once you uh, make that decision that you no longer, you know, want to be a local area and, uh, you know, you want to disband, um, you know, what happens next is really going to be decided outside of your, uh, you know, you all will no longer be involved. And that's, you know, that's the real downside is uh, that, you know, you all, the questions you're asking are good ones. Um, we can't answer those questions ahead of time. You know, once, if, if a request comes in, or not even a request, but if a, if a letter, you know, is sent stating, you know, we no longer want to be a local area and we're not going to run any WIOA programs, um, then, you know, it's sort of out of your hands uh, what happens next. And like Michelle said, the state will, you know, do what, you know, what's feasible given the, the amount of funding that's available. But you will not be involved in those discussions any longer. And, you know, to me, that's a real, uh, you know, that's a real hit to the local control that uh, WIOA sort of uh, aspires to, you know, a balance between state and local control. Um, that will no longer exist. It will be all state control, um, you know, from every everything from, you know, creating a new board, uh, staffing that board, all of that will be decided by the state. Um, Phyllis, I see your question in the chat. So Phyllis asked, would the state become the local grant recipient if they take on the new area? And essentially, yes, the state would um, assume financial liability for that portion of the funding and then have oversight. So, um, yeah, and I would say there are, um, there are examples, you know, there are some states that uh, are running uh, and have run, you know, there we call them single area states. Um, and, that, and those state that this goes back to likely JTPA, which is a program maybe many of you weren't even around for, but I was. And uh, so that kind of structure dates way back. Um, you know, WIOA did not, uh, does not really, uh, speak to states becoming single area states and the impression, you know, as I discussed with our national office, um, because, you know, Michelle and I heard from, I think it was probably Western Iowa that, you know, this is going to spread like wildfire and no CEO is going to want to, uh, everyone's going to want to get, get rid of WIOA and not have that fiscal liability. So were that to happen, uh, you know, or even if that can happen is still sort of a, a question the national office is considering that kind of question would, would go, would need to be answered at a very high level in the national office. We don't know if this administration supports uh, that or not. So, um, so I know there are some examples, but uh, you know it's it's not a scenario that 
uh, will or could happen very readily under WIOA. Yeah, Sandy, I think your question, it's its a question that I have been pondering for weeks and I kept saying to Stacy, you know, I don't understand because the, the, the law says the, the chief elected officials have this liability, but if the feds are saying they can give it up, but yet we have to continue services, well, what's the incentive for them to keep it? I kept, I kept saying to Stacy, like, I don't understand why they would keep it, you know, because, um, and, and really what it boils down to is, is kind of what we've been talking about is, um, and what I've had some conversations, I've had conversations with several CEOs individually, groups, staff, like, I mean, I've been talking about this for weeks now, it feels like, and, um, you know, I guess, the question that people are asking individually is, is, is it worth it for me? Like, am I seeing the return on my work for my constituents? Um, you know, maybe the state can do it better, I think is how people are thinking about it. And, and maybe, maybe we can, I don't know. It's not a place we've been before. I do know that um, we have staff all across the state that are great at providing services locally to the constituents you have already in other areas. And, and um, you know, so I think there would be a lot of, you know, I've been talking through Stacy with, well, what about my role, my team and Wendy and, and our staff who do the compliance? Now we're compliant. Now we'll have compliance over ourselves, And that that's a true statement. Um, you know, we have some firewalls built in at the state already where Linda Rouse's team would, would do this work as the local area, not me, right? I'm not, I'm not going to be seating a local board in any part of the state or doing any of those things because I'm still doing um, the oversight and compliance piece. But those are the questions that we still have to work out. So, and Here. I would say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stacey. Uh, sorry, just no. one other point. Um, you know, <clears throat> for uh, you know. It's the, the timing of all of a sudden, you know, nobody wants uh, the WIOA money uh, seemingly tied to this uh, piece, this governance piece of, of a sub recipient. Um, and, you know, really to me, uh, you know, my, I guess my reaction to it, you know, if I'm thinking from the perspective of a local elected official, which, you know, I'm not, but um, I can think sort of, you know, I, I guess I would want to understand or see if there's any assistance that can be provided to help me understand why this appears to be so, uh, not doable to, I mean, it, so not doable that you are willing to relinquish, you know, these funds and no longer be a local area. I feel like there are some steps in between that we've sort of haven't even really discussed, like could, is there some technical assistance that could help make this a little bit more feasible? Or, um, you know, would it be a good idea for you all to think about, you know, do we need to further realign so that we do have local areas with sufficient funding and we can get our board staffed in a way that would allow the LEOs to really delegate and, and the, the law and the regs are very clear, the CLEO and, and they all do, they delegate this sub-recipient role to their, the board staffing entity or they keep it within their county government. But anyway, I guess my point is that there are, uh, the reactions seem to to you know immediately go to refusing funds seems to me a bit uh, premature and not necessarily in your best interests in terms of 
maintaining some control over what workforce development looks like in your local communities. I would just add, Stacey, I didn't have that on the slides here today, but in the email, I did say, like, if this is a conversation that you're having locally, you, need, you do need to let me know as soon as possible because we are going to be required to have a conversation with Stacy directly for your local area specifically to talk through some of those things. So, um, Eric, I think you had your hand up and then I do see a couple more questions in the chat we'll get to after Eric's question. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name's Eric. I'm the director for the Central Iowa Board. I've been here for five months, so I still have some time to ask questions that represent that. Um, you can't say you're new anymore, Eric. I'm just kidding. Five, five months is still new. I still get that. <laughs> I could use that card for a year. Hey, anyways, um, I think it, uh, I'm wondering if there might be uh, opportunity for some capacity building grants or anything from like the federal level. But like, as I look at it, I feel like part of this issue is about or the main issue is about not necessarily total funding, but that, that we lack diversity in our funding. And um, I think where we struggle sometimes in uh, thinking of this challenge is that um, there's there's managing the WIOA and Title I funding contracts as such a large pronounced part of our board operations. And then there's the role of the local board as a whole. And uh, we wanna be successful at both of those. So. The way like with our board being um, constructed right now and and then seeing the, gr the grant agreement that comes out um, or the potential grant agreement being or contract being 10% of that, it um, really kind of reads to like this almost being a title one grant more so than a, you know, a, 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 a contract to help the, the uh, local workforce carry out their work because again, we lack that, that um, financial diversity in order to carry out the rest of the work. And so um, I think my concern with, and so that's why I'm wondering if there could be capacity building to help local boards grow their, their financial diversity to be able to manage the whole part of this better. Um, because my, my concern is, um, is going to a local recipient that it's only gonna take more attention away from the strategy and that boards want to do in their local area because I think that local recipient is going to take as big as that 10 percent as they can in order to deliver the programs because the only thing they're really contracted to have to do is is deliver title one services um, and make sure they don't incorrectly administer those funds and um, and so, um, and I think it's also part of why we're having a hard time right now finding grant recipients because they're looking at it and saying like that 10% isn't big enough necessarily to feel like taking on the full work of the board as a whole. Maybe we'll take on title one only, but we don't want to, you know, have to also have to deal with um, the management of the rest of what goes into being a local area. Um, so, uh, and I think it's also, it doesn't really make sense for a county to do it long-term. And I think I heard earlier that most of these are ran by other entities and agencies, because I think they're finding a way to use this as a piece of what they do globally and raise money and produce other, other, uh, partnerships and finances off the basis of it. So I'm not really sure what I'm asking other than, um, I guess I, I feel like this isn't so much a issue of not enough finances from WIOA. I feel like it's an issue of not enough diversified funding for the areas. And if we can get there, I feel like if people will be more comfortable holding it. Um, so is there capacity building, Stacey, or anything like that you can do to help up? Maybe something in there made sense, I don't know. No, absolutely. And I think that's what, uh, you know, I, I, yes, there's absolutely uh, opportunity for additional, um, training and capacity building, um, you know, uh, the state, and this probably goes back before your time, but the state has, you know, had a really very uh, strategic approach to technical assistance in the beginning of this transformation effort. And now it appears there's, you know, obviously, uh, we're looking at 
like I said, version 2.0. And so there's certainly room for uh, technical assistance, capacity building. We do have um, some technical assistance dollars um, at, at ETA. And, um, you know, I'm not sure right now, you know, what that looks like or, you know, uh, and or even if we need to access money to be able to provide, you know, technical assistance for you all, uh, you know, that's what we do, uh, federal project officers, um, and uh, we're more than happy to provide assistance. But when we if we do need an experts and the state, obviously, um, is sort of your first uh gateway to, uh, you know, I, to telling them what TA needs you have, and then uh, the state and I can sort of discuss best options. And the one thing that I would add, Eric, too, is the hard part about asking Stacy for diversity of funds is that Stacy is DOL. And any funds we get from DOL are going to have the same requirements on them that the funds we already have is, right? And I think that's one of the issues that everybody runs into is these funds are so strict, we have to do all these specific things and, and all of those things, which is a very true statement. Um, and, and what we're trying to do and what we've been trying to do, and as Stacy said, sort of step by step strategically is put in place this, this, this structure um and the the knowledge and the capacity to be able to do those things at, at a local level right where a, a local board executive director would have the the time and ability to go out and find funding from other sources that have less straight less requirements and things like that that you can use for other um, purposes and, and all of those sorts of things and and i know that that's not a great answer today because it seems like we're very far away from it but, but that is one of the issues that we're dealing with. And we need to get these structures in place so that you have that. And, and I hate to say this again, but I'm going to say it. This is why we have continued to sort of have the conversation about the fact that there is not enough money. We are a small rural state. We don't get a huge allotment of funding. And when we spread it out over as many um, ways as we are right now, nine local areas, it puts a damper, especially if you're in a um, a local area with a smaller allotment, it, it limits your ability to employ the people you need to employ to be able to do those strategic things that you're talking about, right? And so that has to be a part of the discussion as well, so. Yeah, and I just wanna speak to, uh, you know, one of the comments in the in the chat about, you know, the loss of trust um, and this uh, sense that the state sort of misled you all. And, um, you know, that is, you know, absolutely not the case. We uh, and the, the contractor, you know, we, all three parties, state, ETA, and contractor work together following uh, all of the structural issues we identified in 2017 um, and had to take it step by step um, by asking the CEOs to identify fiscal agents. That was the first step. It wasn't misleading in any way. Um, it needed to happen so that the funds were not going directly to Title I service providers. So, you know, the ability at that time in 2017, the only entity doing anything really was the Title I service provider. And we were not at a point where we could uh, go any deeper or further than um, 
asking or requiring the state to execute um, an agreement that uh, between, you know, for the CLIOs to identify a fiscal agent and to get that money to the fiscal agent as opposed to the Title I service provider. You know, there, there are a lot of structural pieces that did not exist and didn't allow the state to move forward with certain pieces until other pieces were already completed. And so, you know, I've been saying this through this entire call that this is sort of the next, uh, the next level of uh, what the structure needs to look like. We couldn't do it all at once. They're just, it just was not possible. And that wasn't done deliberately or in some way, you know, underhanded that is causing some of you to feel like you've lost trust. Um, it was really just done because it wasn't possible to just, you know, snap our fingers and make all of the changes that needed to happen at once. You know, we needed some semblance of a local structure before really doing anything. And when the realignment picture landed where it did, we knew there were still too many local areas. And what that means is there are areas like Western Iowa that have 18 counties and very, very little money um, that likely, you know, could benefit from merging with another local area. So I, I just wanted to speak to that because I continue to get this message that there's some sense that uh, the state misled you all. And, um, you know, we've, we've been working together uh, since 2017 and with this contractor. Um, and, you know, it, like I said, it wasn't gonna happen overnight. I wanna get to um, Danny's question in the chat. So thanks, Danny. So he was asking like, um, he's new and he's in Southeast Iowa. So how, how does this, another area possibly um, disbanding affect him, uh, them in Southeast Iowa? So, um, I guess I guess the answer depends on who what local areas choose to disband, right? So, um, for example, if you're in must you know uh, Mississippi Valley um, and Western Iowa chooses to refuse the funds, then there's probably not a very direct effect on you because um, you have to be um, contingent geographically to another local area to potentially merge together, and you you don't don't touch borders, right? So that couldn't happen. So the real only impact would be if there's a potential change in um, like the allocations, depending on which areas realign, or, or I'm sorry, if multiple areas were to refuse the funding and things like that. But again, a lot of questions up in the air. Now, for example, if say Eastern Iowa, which does touch a border with Mississippi Valley would choose to, to refuse the funds, then one of the first things that as a state we're probably going to do is come to the, the areas around Eastern Iowa and, and talk to you about potentially absorbing those counties, right? So that could potentially be an impact. But again, that would be, in that example, Mississippi Valley agreeing to take on the fiscal liability for those, um, I think it's seven counties in Eastern Iowa, right? So it really depends, um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't see a direct impact in that is situation. And I think, again, this is why I continue to say the communication is key and, and letting us know um, potential um, decisions in local areas as soon as possible so that we can start having those conversations with who needs to have them. Um, Liz, there was a comment in here about concern about staff turnover in IWD finance department. I'm I guess I don't understand why that would impact an, a, an entity's decision about taking on subrecipient duties or that local grant recipient duties. I mean, 
yes, there has been turnover in the finance department, but um, our new CFO is doing a phenomenal job of building that team. And, and um, again, as I keep saying, many of this is about, much of this is about IWG changing as well. So I don't know if it's directly related so much to staff turnover as just the changes that IWD has to make in this process as well. So, um, but if there's something specific going on related to your current fiscal agent or whatever, just let me know. Um, let me see here. So I think Stacy addressed John's question. Um, Eric, a workshop, um, that's technical assistance that we can, we can look into definitely. Um, Krista, I'm just reading these, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think that there continues to be questions about state set aside funds and, and the use of those funds. And, and again, what we have to remember is, yes, we can use those funds to do a multitude of, of state projects, um, training, technical assistance, all sorts of things. When we start giving those funds to the local area, they are programmatic funds. Um, and so, you know, you, whatever amount you're given 5% of that, or I'm sorry, 10% of that can be used for admin, right? That's just the way the law is written about those funds. So I can't magically change that. I can't give you a chunk of statewide set aside and say, you get to use it only for admin. That's, that is not allowable. And so, um, you know, but if there are other examples of, of training or technical assistance that we could potentially use, um, you know, absolutely let me know. You, I think you guys all have my phone number. Call me. We can talk about it. We can we can get things planned, um, whatever. But simply giving people chunks of statewide set aside is not going to solve the problem of not enough administrative funds in any local area. Um, let me see here. So and then, you know, yeah, trying to find additional funding sources is absolutely um, something that we can all work together on. So I think that's all the questions in the chat. I don't see any more hands. Michelle? Right yeah. Yeah. Um, one more question. Just quickly. Yeah. Um, which way does the state really prefer to do? Would they prefer to have state control or let it be with the local control? I mean, I don't think that there's a preference, Sandy. I I think what I think, yeah, this is Sandy. Sorry. Um, I think what, what we want to do is make sure that constituents are receiving services to the best degree possible. Um, and so, you know, we want to we want to make that work. I mean, the, this law is designed upon local control, um, but with local control comes responsibility, right? To to do the work and to be involved. And you know, I appreciate you guys being here today and, and asking questions and being involved. I mean, we've talked how many times, Sandy, about all this stuff, but I'm just, just looking at the, the number of people on the call. There's 26 people on the call, several of whom are state employees, and there were over 280 people invited that are local people, right? I mean, that's well less than 10% of the people who's impacted by this and participating, you know? And so I think that, that that has something to do with it, right? We have to get people engaged if, if we're gonna, if local control and, and the work being done locally makes sense. And to do that, you have to have the funding to staff the, the way it needs to be staffed yeah. because we know you guys have full-time jobs. We know that CEOs sit on eight, 10, 12 boards, right? We know that, the local board members have full-time jobs where they are leaders of their companies and um that's the importance of of these the structure and, and the people involved with it so um well the reason I, why i asked that is because at one time didn't they want to just have two um uh territories or two i don't know what right but two, so two local areas is still not state control right that's still local control the number of areas is about how we divide the funding, right? So mm -hmm. having less local areas means having less need for fiscal agents and, and, and less need for local grant recipients that have to do that work, less executive directors, right? 
that um, instead of paying for nine executive directors at an executive director salary, you're paying for two, um, right? And that's why we talk about reducing the number of local areas. And Stacy was the one who said this um, earlier in the call, but you know, I have long been honest with everybody that we still need less local areas in Iowa. I'm not, I'm not pushing it. I have not. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, this this time around, all the discussions about local area realignment have come from you all, right? Ground ground up, um, which I think is great, and we've fully supported that conversation and discussion. Um, but but it's about how far the money stretches, and and but even if the state had two local areas, that's still locally controlled services. Um, but but it allows the, you know roughly $10 million, let's say, it's more than that, but let's just use $10 million to be divided by two local areas. So if each local area had um, $5 million to deal with, you know, and you, and you can use 10% of that for your administrative pot, now you have some funds you can actually sort of do something with. You can support multiple staff for one board instead of just one person trying to do everything, right? Um, and that, and that's really what it boils down to. So pushing for two local areas is not about state control or not even two, let's just say a reduced number of local areas is, is not about state control. It's about ensuring that local areas have the right, um, resources to be able to do everything you're required to do. And that I think is a lot of the stress is right now, especially in some of the smaller local areas or, or maybe geographically big, but not well-funded um, local areas, that's the stress, right? It's a small amount of money to do a lot of stuff that you're required to do, so. Yeah, and just I mean, as I'm looking in the chat, I see Kyle Stecker mentioning that, you know, they're losing a lot of uh, CEOs um, you know, those that have been around long term. And, you know, that's really why WIOA expects that the CEO will delegate his or her subrecipient responsibilities to another entity. If your county government is not able to, does not have that capacity. Uh, you know, we owe a, a lot, you know, really allows for that kind of uh, delegation. And, but as Michelle was saying, we then bump up against the fact that there are uh, too many, the, the, the funds are spread too thin. There's still too many uh, local areas. Uh, merging local areas would allow, you know, obviously additional funds, potentially establishing uh, staff to the board that could incorporate and could, uh, you know, the CEO would delegate to that entity. That entity as an incorporated entity could apply for uh, all kinds of other grant funds from all kinds of different uh, sources, um, just a lot of advantages to that structure. Uh, but I understand that it is not doable right now in Iowa. And Kyle, to your points about additional funding, I mean, I, I don't know where the, the presentation of county funding was provided. It wasn't me. I, that's not something I've said or told you to do. I think that there are some counties that have talked about that, and, and that is absolutely an option. You also have the ability to go out and find other sources of funding, and that's always been um, an option and, and discussed. But when it comes to other sources of funding from the state, as I said, um, there are very strict requirements on what can be done with the um, statewide set aside. That's the only other pocket of funding that we have available. Um, you know, general fund dollars is something you have to talk to your legislators about. I, that's not something I control, right? Um, there's already a very large portion of general fund dollars being put into the system 
via the AJCs and the staff that are there through the state um, state employment, right? So that is happening already. Um, but but you know, I I don't I don't think this is the first time we're talking about other ways to fund. So um, let's see here. Um, Okay, so we do, have, well, the last section that I really wanted to start, because it is 1030 already, was this about local area realignment. I don't have any slides for this. It was just, does anybody have any questions who are who are discussing this or that want to discuss this? Um, but given the fact that we are over time, um, I'll probably just skip this. And you all know how to find me. My information's here at the end of the slides as well again. But just for wrap up and next steps. So again, the next steps really center around these decisions. So um, as you know, when we, we, we provided the training in November, we said that each local area needed to identify and or designate their local grant recipient. Um, we requested that that be done by February 28th. I've had a couple of questions about that. This is not, um, uh, uh, first of all, it's not an arbitrary date, right? We picked this date intentionally because really everything takes effect July 1st. So in order to meet that deadline, backing into that, you know, making this decision on or near February 28th is going to allow you the time to have everything in place and completed by July 1 to, to be able to receive the next allotment of funds. So if you aren't going to be able to do this by February 28th, again, on the slide, communication is key. Just Call me, talk to me, let me know. We we are in this together and working on this together and we can work that out. So um, if you are planning on doing a realignment, a voluntary realignment, um, you know, you, um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, yeah, realigning of local workforce areas. I'm not skipping ahead, sorry. Um, if you are, Intending to realign, reminder, you need to send a letter to the state board. You can do that by sending it to me. Um, I am the executive director of the state board or Shelly um, Evans, and we'll get that on the agenda. The next board meeting is on March 8th, so we would need that a couple of weeks in advance of that date to ensure that, or you know, February 20th, that we can get it on the um, agenda for the state board. And then obviously, if you are even discussing or going to be contemplating refusing the Title I funds, please reach out and let me know so that we can schedule um, a TA call with Stacy and DOL and help walk through that process with you. And again, I just, I know that these are not easy conversations. I know this is difficult um, for everybody and everyone is um, trying to gather as much information as possible to make an informed decision. I appreciate that completely. And so please just call me and um, sometimes the difficult conversations are the best ones. So um, I'm committed to having those conversations with you all. And um, I appreciate your time today. Again, my information on here and then Wendy, who's my bureau chief who oversees the Title I program um, is also available to you at any point. So um, yeah, please reach out and thank you. Um, and we will talk soon. Oh, I do wanna do one reminder. Um, we, we rescheduled this, our normal every two week call was supposed to be last week, but we want we changed it so that we can make sure Stacy could join us today. So it's today. So technically the next office hour calls will be scheduled for next Friday. I haven't sent that out yet because I was waiting for updated um, CEO contact information to make sure that infor the, the long-term reoccurring um, two week, every two week um, meeting is, is on the right people's calendar. So I'm gonna send that out this afternoon for next Friday. Um, as of this moment, I don't have anything that I will present plan to present at that meeting, but again, we'll jump on and allow you time to ask questions or whatever. Um, if you have a topic you'd like me to cover, please let me know. And then you also don't have to wait until an office hour calls to contact me. So thank you all. I hope you have a great um, rest of your day and a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle.